Hello, my name is Jim Turk. I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's event. Um, before I begin, though, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This is the second in the Center for Free Expressions 2122 virtual forum series. And I would like to thank our co-sponsor for today's panel. They are the Edmonton Public Library, the Milton Public Library, the Ryerson Journalism Research Center, the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library. The topic for today is publication bans versus press freedom and open courts. The open court principle is a cornerstone of our legal system. The Supreme Court has reaffirmed stringent conditions for any judge considering whether to limit what can be reported from the courtroom. In practice, however, publication bans are often granted on scant argument or evidence. What does this mean for press freedom, for the public's right to know, and for the integrity of our legal system? We have an impressive group of panelists today who are going to explore these questions. And I'd like to introduce them now. Our first panelist is Ryder Gilliland. Ryder is past president of the Canadian Media Lawyers Association, a founding partner in the law firm DMG Advocates, and a member of the advisory board of the Center for Free Expression. For more than 15 years, he has been advising community and metropolitan newspapers, digital publishers, book publishers, broadca and broadcasters on issues relating to defamation law, publication bans, sealing orders, privacy, and copyright, and has acted in leading cases in many of these areas. Ryder is also an adjunct professor at Ryerson, where he has taught media law to journalism students for a decade. Welcome, Ryder. Thank you. Good to be here. Our second panelist is Alicia Hashem. Alicia is a courts reporter at the Toronto Star. She has reported on legal issues and trials since 2014 and spends much of her life, I imagine, in courtrooms, whether physically or these days virtually. Along with her colleague, Wendy Gillis, Alicia received the 2021 Landsberg Award from the Canadian Journalism Foundation in recognition of her stories addressing women's experience of male violence including police workplace sexual harassment and exploring potential solutions. She earned her Bachelor of Journalism degree at Carleton University. Welcome, Alicia. Our third, I'm sorry. Our third panelist is Paul Shabas. Paul is a judge in the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Prior to his appointment in 2019, he practiced criminal law uh, before joining Blake, Castles, and Graydon where he had a broad civil and regulatory litigation practice with a focus on media and constitutional law. He was counsel on many of the leading charter cases, including Morgenthaler, Canadian Foundation for Our Children, Toronto Star v. Ottawa, I mean, sorry, Ontario, and Grant v. Uh, Torstar. From 2016 to 2018, Justice Shabus was the head of the Law Society of Ontario, where he championed diversity and inclusion access to justice, and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. For many years, Justice Chavis taught media law at the University of Ta Toronto Faculty of Law and trial advocacy at Osgood Hall Law School. Welcome. Thank you. Our final panelist is Alexi Wood. Alexi is a founding partner at St. Lawrence Barristers. She represents clients at all levels of courts in Ontario, as well as at the <clears throat> Supreme Court of Canada. She also acts on a pro bono basis for social justice and environmental organizations. Her practice includes a wide range of commercial litigation, administrative and regulatory disputes, and professional regulation. And she acts for clients in tort matters, including issues related to health law, defamation, harassment, and privacy, including online harassment and non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Alexi is an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Welcome, Alexi. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Justin Safiani. 
Justin is a lawyer and a partner at Stockwoods. He practices mainly in the areas of civil commercial litigation, administrative law and constitutional law, with a particular interest in defamation matters and cases raising freedom of expression issues. Justin acts for media organizations in challenges to publication bans and sealing orders, among other matters. He has appeared before all levels of courts in Ontario and several times before the Supreme Court of Canada. Justin teaches administrative law at Osgoode Hall Law School's a professional LLM program and writes frequently on legal topics in both legal and mainstream publications. After earning his law degree at the University of Toronto, Justin clerked for the Honorable Justices Laskin, Googe, and McFarland in the Ontario Court of Appeal. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Jim. Now, the format for today's conversation amongst our panelists uh, is going to be the following. Uh, they will uh, have a conversation amongst themselves around the issues we've uh, discussed. And after about 45 minutes to 55 minutes, uh, Justin will turn to Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, who uh, to uh, bring forward questions that have put up, been put by the audience. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button um, and just click on that. And at any time during the during the uh, panel discussion, uh, you have a question. Just write down your question there. You don't have to wait till we get to the uh, till uh, Justin turns to Ange for questions. Just write down your question there uh, as you think of it. And when uh, after, as I say, forty five to fifty minutes, uh, uh, you'll the your question will be asked to the panel, and they'll have a chance to discuss it. Uh, other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. So over to you, Justin. Thank you, Jim, and thanks to uh, Ryerson, the Center for Free Expression, and the other organizers and sponsors of um, of this event. So let me just start by asking, you know, the basic question, which is to try and help set the foundation and orient our discussion today. You know, what is the open court principle that we heard Jim speak about, and I'm sure we've all heard that term before. What is this principle? Um, what are publication bans and, and what's the kind of tension between the open court principle and publication bans? And maybe Ryder, I'll ask you to kind of start this off um, and invite others to jump in uh, once you're done. Sure. So the open court principle is, is a fundamental and now constitutionally protected for, for several decades, constitutionally protected assumption that everything that open, happens in courts has to be open to the public. Um, it's more recently been found to apply to administrative tribunals as, as well as courts, but we still generally use the, the term open court principle, which whichever context. The assumption behind it is that the justice system works better when it's open and transparent uh, and allows the public to criticize what, what they see happening. And, and there's also other ideas such as that it keeps witnesses more honest uh, when they're testifying, when they know that things are going to be broadcast publicly. But the, the main idea behind it is that uh, it keeps the justice system on guard, knowing that it's it's being watched, as opposed to you know having decisions made uh, behind closed doors. The openness principle is not absolute. There are situations that do arise in which some sort of limitation on openness is is necessary. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some of them today, but it's generally speaking situations where there's a tension between an interest other than the open court interest and and the open court interest, and in those situations, we can end up with a publication ban as, or, or other, other types of, of limits, but the one that we hear about most is, is a publication ban. And what a publication ban does, as the name suggests, is it prevents publication of what's transpiring in court, or at least part of what's transpiring in court. A publication ban can be as limited as to covering somebody's name to as broad as, as covering an entire, an entire proceeding in, in certain situations. The, so that's that's the, the tension that happens. In the case of a publication ban, you can still go to court, the public can still attend court proceedings, see what's happening. It's just it's limited to preventing publication of what, what they saw or witnessed or some of what they saw or witnessed. There are broader bans such as sealing orders, which can prevent uh, access to anything in a court file, or even exclusionary orders, which can prevent access to the court. Uh, the more extreme the, the, the limit, the, the rarer you expect to see them, or the more rarely you expect to see them. But uh, that's the, the general lay of the land, of the land with respect to openness and publication bans. 
Right. So we you've, you've kind of described this. There's there's a bit of a continuum. And publication bans, which are going to be the focus of of our discussion today, is are at one spot on the continuum, and there are kind of increasingly more extreme orders that you can make. You can make sealing orders, which actually prevent people from accessing what is in the court file. So not just that you can't publish it, but you can't actually see it. And then exclusionary orders, which prevent the public from even going into the courtroom to begin with. Um, Alexi, let me let me turn to you and ask kind of to take us through uh, the general legal principles or the framework that courts use to figure out when is a publication ban justified? Like what is the actual test that a court is going to um, apply or attempt to apply to figure that question out in a given case? Absolutely. So it's uh, it's actually a very timely question. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada just a few months ago issued a decision in the uh, the Sherman family case, the Barry and Honey Sherman um, case, that obviously attracted a lot of media a lot of media attention when it first happened. Um, and that case, a part of that case, ended up going up to the Supreme Court of Canada recently. Um, and in that case, um, it was uh, dealing with some of the trustee issues and family issues related to that case. And the Supreme Court of Canada in that case held that the publication ban was not justified um, and ordered that um, the information be provided. And what happened in that case is the, the court took the opportunity to explain um, and to clarify what had previously been the test. So what, what's important coming out of the test is there's three parts to the test that the court talks about. Um, but really what the court focuses on is that um, it's not enough when coming to the court to ask for a general publication ban and to say that there's a general interest that is at play. There needs to be specificity with regards to the interests that are at play and why specifically, there's going to be a publication ban. And one of the main reasons that the publication ban failed in the Sherman Estates case was because the interests being put forward were more broadly specified. They were of a general nature. And the Supreme Court said that that wasn't enough to um, overcome the very high burden and the very important aspect of the open court principle. Um, so in particular, just to give some context for it, the three prints, the three prongs of the test are that um, someone coming to the court has to establish that the court openness poses a serious risk to an important public interest. And usually that important public interest is going to be a privacy interest. That's usually what we're going to be discussing. Um, second, that the order sought is necessary to prevent the serious risk to the identified interest because other alternatives are not going to be sufficient. And then the last part is that as a matter of proportionality, there's a bit of a weighing test that the negative, that the benefits are going to outweigh the negative aspects. And that three prong test clarified the law that had previously been in existence, but this is now the test that has to come forward. And as I said, really what the court was getting at is the specificity that's required um, in order to overcome this very important principle of open court principles. Right. And I, I'm, we're going to come back to kind of what, what you said about the, the, the magic phrase there. It's the, I think in the first part of the test of a serious risk to an important public interest and what qualifies as an important public interest, including privacy. I'm going to, going to come back to that, but um, just before we leave, leave the test, you've, I think you've done a nice, encapsulation of of what the test is when uh, in situations where courts enjoy uh discretion over whether to make um a publication ban uh, or not and that discretion can exist as a matter of of common law in other words courts just kind of have the discretion in a particular case to do it if they think it's required um for the administration of justice or under statute, uh, a law that actually gives the court discretion or requires the court to consider whether a publication ban is appropriate. But there's also situations where a law actually 
either requires a publication ban to be made in certain situations or uh, narrows the discretion so as to say, you know, if A happens, then you have to make a publication ban and kind of sets a condition precedent to that. Um, I don't know if Ryder or Alicia, if either of you want to talk about some of those situations where publication bans, uh, it's not necessarily the kind of three-part test that, that Alexi described, which is often the case, but a but a more narrow situation where um, the bans either apply automatically or based on something, uh, a kind of a tripwire that, that's not quite as extensive as, as that test. Yeah, I can talk about this. I just actually wrote a story recently about an example um, where this happened in a way that's now being taken to court. So it's a case um, involving child pornography and so there's a publication ban that applies in cases of child pornography that bans the identification of victims. On the face of it, that sounds really great and very important. There's obviously important policy reasons why we have that in place. But in this particular case, and I can't get into like the details of the case, but like it's a case that is actually really well known and had been well known prior to charges being laid. And the mother of the victim was very vocal, was telling um, this story in schools was using it as a tool of public education and like making really heartfelt connections with like other families who had been through something like this. And a very similar situation came up in the Retea Parsons case in Nova Scotia after the suicide of a teenager, um, Retea, after bullying. And this publication ban prevents that story from being told. It prevents those parents from talking about uh, their daughter's stories and there is no mechanism. And this is like really, really unusual. And this is kind of like a, a really exceptional publication ban. Let me tell you what section it is. If people, it's 48, uh, 46.4 subsection three. And you like a judge can't lift it. So in the Nova Scotia case, like they went to court and they were like, can we just like in this really exceptional case where like everyone agrees that we should like be able to say this girl's name and the judge was like, no, there's like nothing I can do about it. The criminal code doesn't let me do anything about it. And that was a couple of years ago, it was in 2015. Now we've got a case, same situation. And there's just like nothing that can be done. And so we have suddenly this publication ban goes into effect. And I can't even tell you like which case it is, like where it's taking place or anything about it. And so there are these like, most publication bans have like an exception, but some of them don't, some of them are really strict and automatic and um, and I don't know if they were intended to be that way, I guess, but. So that's, that's one situation. We see these, not exactly that same thing, but we see these kind of peppered throughout the criminal code in certain situations or where there's certain types of offenses that have happened. The law actually directs a publication ban either to be imposed no matter what, uh, or if a certain party requests it uh, kind of automatically. Um, Ryder and Paul, I know you were both involved in, in, a, in a case involving, uh, not exactly the same, but a, again, a reduced discretion type situation involving bail, uh, the bail provisions. I don't know if you want to talk um, briefly, briefly about that case, which went all the way up to, to the Supreme Court as well. Uh, sure, I'll jump in here, uh, Justin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Ryder and I will we'll remember that loss for many years. When <laughs> I, I don't lose cases anymore, I don't win them either. But I just decide them. But uh, we had a long battle arising from a, uh, a terrorism case. The for those of you who can remember back to what was the the Toronto 18 or the Brampton 18, and uh, when they were arrested. Uh, uh, you know, for their conspiracy and their plans to blow up the parliament buildings and the CN Tower and things like that. Um, their bail hearings came up and um, some of the accused wanted a ban and some of the accused didn't want a ban on the bail hearing and the criminal code provides that uh, if an accused asks for a ban, there shall be a ban. And uh, the court interpreted that, that they were all having their hearings together and therefore all of these bail hearings uh, were subject to a publication ban. We challenged the constitutionality of that provision. Um, interestingly, if the Crown asks for a ban, 
the judge has discretion. But if the accused asks for it, it's automatic. And, uh, you know, that's the only thing we could do uh, to challenge that. The judge says, well, my hands are tied unless you persuade me that this law is unconstitutional, that it violates freedom of expression under the charter, because that's where the open court principle is rooted in this concept of freedom of expression, that people have both the right to express information and the right to receive information. And uh, uh, it did go to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, we got some dissents, but a majority uh, ruled that uh, the law was constitutional and it had to weigh concerns about the bail process concern, you know, and we, we may talk a bit about this, the practical challenges of uh, addressing requests for publication bans on short notice, especially in the criminal justice system where uh, bail hearings come on very quickly. The most important thing is the liberty of the subject of the accused who wants to get their liberty back. Uh, and um, then, you know, they had to balance that against the public interest in, um, in, uh, in understanding what happens at a bail hearing and in understanding why someone is released or not released. Uh, it's an interesting problem. And uh, I, I wrote an article a few years later after, after I lost it all. It was titled, what, hap what happens at a bail hearing anyway? Question mark. Because in fact, um, there's very little reporting on what goes on in bail hearings because they are almost always subject to a publication ban. And I think uh, you know, that's still true today. But it's an example, a different kind of example from Alicia's of, uh, of the different kinds of bans that exist. I will just jump in very quickly to say the sure. fact that we can't report on what on what goes on in most bail hearings is, in my view, a real problem for the understanding of the bail system. And that has a lot of repercussions for like how we discuss things like bail reform, um, about how police talk about bail in a specific way. It's often discussed as like too many people are out on bail and or like this person got bail and it's a scandal. We had a case just now where the premier himself weighed in on a decision to grant a person charged with first degree murder bail. We can't say why that person was granted bail or whether it was a reasonable decision or not because there's a publication ban that's in place. And so it really inhibits our ability to talk about really important policy issues. So like that's just like part of the public interest part of it, but it really frustrates me as a reporter because like people are arguing about it and like talking about it and I can't explain to them what happened and whether it was a good decision or not. So I wanna follow up on that point Alicia and, and kind of move from from the 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 legal or theoretical aspect of it to dis discussing the practical implications a little bit more impressing you on that so when it comes to actually reporting on cases where there is a publication ban whether that ban is made under the criminal code pursuant to something that the judge just has to do because their hands are tied or one that's more discretionary where the judge has gone through the analysis that Alexi led us through how does that impact on what uh, you can do? I mean, there's the basic point that you know you you can't can't report certain things if there's a publication ban. But just walk us through, you know, how do you, how do you figure out if a ban exists? If one exists, how do you figure out what it covers? I mean, what is what is the on the ground? Uh, what does that look like on the ground for you? It sounds like it should be really easy, right? Like, does it is there a publication ban, and like, what does it cover? It's like such a basic question, but it is so hard to answer a lot of the time. Um, so like step one is, is there a publication ban? So it's a very practical question, not should there be a publication ban or those are like very like lawyer questions. Um, it's, you know, some cases automatically trigger them sex assault cases, if it's a bail hearing, is there a jury? Like you can think about those kinds of things where you might expect one, but to find out if there actually is one, you have to get the court document. And in the court document, like that lists the charges, someone will have scrawled in like a tiny section of the paper, 517 or 46.4, or like something, it's like maybe not even legible. It's in different spaces on like the paper. Like you have to like really look for it. It can take a while to get this document as well. It's not something that's automatic. And then court staff will often tell you there is a publication ban, but they won't say what section it's under or like what it covers. So often publication bans, um, especially discretionary ones, are put on like witnesses in a case, right. maybe for specific reasons, maybe they're a minor, maybe, um, you know, there you have to have a hearing for something like this, but maybe there's a risk to their safety or something. They're not going to tell you what witness publication ban covers, they're just gonna tell you that there is one. So then you have to like start to contact people, bother people, sometimes you have to like stand up in court, which is just 
awful to have to do. No, no judge wants to like be interrupted by me. Um, and then eventually try and figure out is, is there a publication ban? Who does it apply to? And I'm trying to do all of that while like at a hearing and I need that information immediately sorry, immediately because I need to write a story immediately. So it's actually a really, we have a really terrible system of like taking what is like a very, very, very important thing, a publication ban, like Ryder talked about how like the open court principle is really, really important. And so we have this like, it's supposed to be this rare exception, but in practice, it's very, very hard to figure out where they apply, how they apply. No one's giving you any information. So like I have access to the Toronto Star's legal counsel so I can ask questions, but like most people can't and everyone is expected to abide by these publication bans, including members of the public. It's not just me, right? Anyone can go and ask for these documents. Anyone can go and like go sit in a jury trial, but do they know that you, if a jury isn't in the room, you can't share any of what is being said publicly. People are on Twitter now, like, do, like I worry about this a lot. Like people don't always understand these things. And just the other thing I will like say about what does it cover is that it's like a really subjective question. So like, if you have a sex assault case, for example, it prohibits the publication of the identity of someone who is um, a complainant or a victim of sexual assault. So say, say it's me. So it's Alicia Hashem, 32 newspaper reporter at the Toronto Star right? That's like maybe how you would identify me in a newspaper article. Okay, so you take away my name, that's easy. Do you take away my age? Mm, it depends. How closely do you like specify my profession? Like, is it is Toronto Star too specific? Is it is Toronto too specific? Is newspaper too specific? Like, where do you start to draw the lines? Like the context of where things happen? Like, is it like close to your house? There's all kinds of like, things that you have to make like active decisions while you're in court about like, will this violate the publication ban? And there's not like a list of things that you can follow. So it can be really subjective. And the last thing I'll say is like, sometimes these decisions are really like hard and emotional and like difficult. So, you know, there's like cases where like parents are charged with like killing their children and there'll be a publication ban that's put on the name of the surviving siblings to like figure out if you can like then start reporting on the names of like those parents is like a difficult and complex question. There has been litigation on this and like, you know, it's, it's a thing that's discussed, but these are like decisions that you have to make quickly and it's not always easy and simple. So like very simple straightforward questions and very like complicated answers. Yeah, no, that's, that's very useful and I, I, you know, in the course of advising um, journalists who are trying to sort through these issues, I mean, I've I've uh, been involved in trying to make those calls, and it often is uh, difficult difficult to make. And we'll return to this later, but there can be very real world consequences, including um, facing charges for um, breaching publication bans. Ryder and Alexi, I don't know if you have anything to add to to that based on. Um, your experience trying to navigate through the, the practical implications of it. Well, one thing that was coming to mind um, in hearing Alicia speak is, is a situation that actually occurs uh, and it's quite bizarre, but it occurs quite regularly is, is in the context of sealing orders, uh, which is another is a situation uh, uh, when you talk about search warrants, you can get a, it's a, another situation where the criminal code provides for an automatic uh, sealing order, which actually makes sense in the short term because of course, if the suspect knew that they were about to have a warrant executed at their home, they might take some precautionary measures. But uh, the, the, that sealing order, because it's so broad and applies to the entire file, will often result in, in the sealing order itself being under seal. Um, so we've had a number of situations where we're actually trying to challenge a sealing order, but don't have access to the to the ceiling order itself, and this is something that continues to happen, even though uh, even though there is jurisprudence that, that <laughs> makes clear that the ceiling order should not be under seal. Um, you know these things. You know the, the courts are, are busy places. There's a lot going on, um, and you know I assume that you know, some some staff member sees okay the this the entire file is under seal. It makes sense to them to to do what that says literally. Um, and not keep the order outside of, of, of the ceiling. 
it becomes Kafkaesque in a way, right? Like you can't even see the order that you're trying to uh, to unseal. Um, it, it does happen. Uh, um, the writer and Alicia, both of their comments are bringing back a lot of old memories. <laughs> not all, not all good ones from my days uh, working for the representing the media. <laughs> Well, Paul, let me let me ask you about a different kind of um, set of maybe practical challenges that can arise in some of these situations, which is the possibility that, you know, in a busy courtroom where a, a judge is faced with deciding a number of different issues, including the actual case in front of them, which usually is not a publication ban case. It has you know, it's a million other issues and a publication ban is pretty far down the list of um, them in terms of what might be at the forefront of the court's mind, um, there is a possibility that uh, a publication ban could be uh, kind of requested, sometimes with very little notice, sometimes with no notice on the spot, and the court kind of has to make a call on this issue. Um, but they don't have anybody on the other side of the equation necessarily, right? There's somebody in front of the court saying, look, I want a publication ban because um, privacy interests or another interest that they're trying to safeguard and the judge has to kind of make a call about whether or not to impose one or to at least deal with this request in the absence of somebody like um uh rider on the other side saying actually I, I don't think a publication ban is justified so how how do courts in ontario deal with this particular concern um uh, to try and get a, a balanced perspective, or at least give a chance for a balanced perspective. Yeah, so there are, there are a couple of things that have that have developed over the last couple of decades on this, because um, it really it's been over the last 10, 15 years or so that this has really evolved. One of which is that the there is a now, of course, a heightened awareness of the need to give notice um, where possible, where practical. Um, and the Superior Court, which is where all, all major civil cases are tried and, and serious criminal cases are tried, has a notice protocol um, that if you do wish to seek to uh, any kind of a publication ban, you are supposed to give advance notice. And there is a, uh, a process, you do it online and then a notification goes out to the media and any media can sign up to receive notice of these things. Um, so that they can come and and argue against them. Um, I think there is a, a much more of an awareness of that among um, the judges, uh, certainly in the Superior Court. And I think judges across the, the province and across the country are much more attuned to to the the jurisprudence that's developed that says you you know you have to give notice where you can. Um, I think we're seeing fewer of those sort of notice uh, surprise uh, surprise applications in part actually because uh, these are things that are supposed to be canvassed in advance. You know, uh, one thing that is not open uh, in, in courts are what they call pretrial conferences where the, a judge who will not be the trial judge typically will sit down with the lawyers in advance of a trial and say, look, how long is this going to take? How many witnesses are you each calling? What are you going to do as far as documents are concerned? And there's a whole checklist of things. And one of the issues is, you know, anybody ask, going to be asking for any kind of a publication ban or restriction on access to the public. So that means that if somebody does suddenly stand up right in the middle of a hearing and say, hey, I want a ban, um, you know, I think many judges, the first thing they're going to say is, well, why are you raising this now? Why didn't this get raised earlier? Because as you say, Justin, uh, you know, it's, uh, especially when you're in a serious trial and or a serious criminal trial, you know, you're dealing with very significant rights and issues that are affecting people's lives. And they don't want to be sidetracked by that either and be taken by surprise on that. Um, uh, but, you know, it will arise sometimes. It may, and quite frankly, you know, it might be something that in fairness, nobody really uh, saw coming, that there is some kind of a tricky privacy interest that's being raised or an interest about whether something's going to impact on somebody else's rights that needs to be addressed. And, uh, you know, hopefully the courts will have the ability to say, well, um, let's make sure somebody's you know, people are at least notified to, so that if any media um, 
want to uh, come and oppose this, or a member of the public wants to come and oppose uh, the ban, that they have the opportunity to do so. Now, sometimes they don't come. Uh, I think more often now than before, because media have far fewer resources to fight these things than they used to. And so that means the judges have to be a little more alive to, um, to the law themselves, because it's, a, it's hard for a judge when they're not getting the other side, but they know that uh, there is another side to this. And, you know, I, I do the best, I, I will do the best I can when those things arise, and I, my colleagues do too. It's, it's interesting mentioning that, um, uh, you know, the, the media having fewer resources. I mean, you, you see it um, more and more now that journal, and Alicia, I don't know if you've been in this position, but journalists themselves are raising the issue. I mean, they'll be in the courtroom. They won't have a lawyer. The issue will come up and they will at least try and flag it um, on their own. And indeed, in the, in the Sherman case, I think at least at first instance, it was it was a one of your colleagues from the Star, Alicia, who who <laughs> argued that on on his on his own and and was um, eventually eventually successful. Um, one of one of the areas, and we've kind of alluded to this already, but there's you know for people who may not be um, kind of familiar with publication bans, it's kind of useful to think of it as you know it can either arise in a, in a civil proceeding where people are. Um, uh, ha, you know, have have a plaintiff has chosen to commence a, a some sort of court process, and they are um, either the plaintiff or the defendant in that process is is seeking a publication ban, um, or it can arise in in the criminal law process where uh, you have things like the bail hearing, um, where situations like what Alicia described um, in terms of the the publication ban that was mandatory. Can arise because the criminal code says that that uh, it just this is the way it's going to be. Um, I want to I want to just focus for a second, if I could, on on the criminal law context and and because that is where we see a lot of these publication bans because the criminal code provides for them in so many different situations. Um, Ryder, can you talk to us maybe a little bit more about why they arise in that context and? You know, privacy is one of the interests that arise in that context, but what some of the other interests might be as well that may motivate um, uh, imposing uh, publication bans in, in the criminal law context specifically and that we don't necessarily see in the civil law context. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few of them. The, as, as we were discussing before, whenever, whenever there's a, an infringement of the openness principle, there's, there's some other right weighing against it. You mentioned privacy. In the context of, of criminal trials, uh, an important one uh, that probably is the one that comes up the most is the fair trial interests of the accused. That's, for example, what the bail hearing provision is, is intended to protect. Uh, we say wrongly, but we were overruled by the Supreme Court of Canada on that. So, um, so the because there is an argument that that when you have a bail hearing, no matter what happens at the bail hearing, no matter what's published, if you have a trial, you know, a year later or more later, it, it's not going to impede the ability uh, of, of the court to, to get a jury that can to try the case fairly. But um, that arg that argument, frankly, I think that's an argument that that uh, the Supreme Court might have even been somewhat sympathetic to. But there are other practical considerations that that weighed into that decision. But fair trial interest is something that that comes up throughout the criminal code, bail hearings uh, is, as I mentioned, preliminary hearings, which also are, are potentially subject to a, a ban in the same circumstances. Um, so you have that running, and there's, a, as I say, a number of other situations. So you have that running through the entire code. Then you have things like, which was also alluded to before, uh, provisions that protect uh, both, uh, well, the identity of complainants in sexual assault cases, actually witnesses and complainants. So the witnesses one is a little bit harder to understand, but. Uh, Complainants is there for, for obvious reasons to uh, encourage uh, or certain, at least not discourage victims from, from coming forward. Uh, and then you have provisions like, for example, the, the search warrant provisions. So provisions that are there to protect uh, investigations. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, you have a, a sealing order obtained on the asking when, when, when the police get a search warrant. Um, and the idea behind that is again to protect the investigation. There's other provision, provisions that protect confidential informants. So, I mean, that's 
that's probably the main ones. But but as I was saying, there's there's a whole slew of, of different situations that arise in the criminal context that actually don't arise in the civil context, which can lead to, to publication bans or, in some cases, sealing orders. Let me just go back to the fair trial rights one for a moment because it's just it's useful I think to maybe unpack that for for members of the audience who may not kind of totally follow follow the logic there. So the the the, the logic is that you're if you have a lot of media reporting on a particularly prejudicial piece of information, that could taint the jury pool in a way that you're not going to be able to get jurors who can fairly decide the case once it comes trial time, right? And this always struck me as in most cases, in all but kind of the most extreme cases where there's just totally saturated wall-to-wall -wall media coverage, it seems to kind of rely on a presumption of human memory that at least in my own brain and experience just does not really exist. I don't know, what what are your kind of views on that chain of reasoning and, and when it might hold uh, as, as compared to how often it's applied? Well, it's probably obvious that I, I, I agree with you. Um, I do think- That's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I do think one, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, this doesn't really justify the provisions uh, and certainly the scope of them, but these provisions came in place at a different time. Uh, you know, we, and, and you know, we, we, we all of us on, on on this on this conference are located in Toronto, which is a huge metropolitan center uh, with a lot of news breaking every day. Um, and and so yeah, I, I think what your comments apply with particular force in this day and age uh, with media saturation and 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 in a place like this with uh, just a lot of things happening. So it's hard to keep, unfortunately, hard to keep track sometimes of of what crimes are being reported. I think, you know, at the time that these provisions came into place, you could imagine, uh, you know, a, a, a big crime in a, in a, in a smaller town um, and, and the concern about being able to draw from a smaller population, a, a jury pool. I mean, I think that is the, the kind of reasoning that, that drove these provisions in the first place. I do think that they are antiquated and, uh, and generally, useless for their intended purpose and of course have the, the unintended or, or you know, the secondary result of, of preventing the public from, from knowing what's happening. And I think you know the discussion we had about bail hearings is is a really good example of that where um, it's it's you know my view uh, that that it's that's highly unlikely in most cases that that publication of, of what happens at a bail hearing is actually going to impede the ability to get 12 jurors. And I thought it was interesting actually because there was a case that was alluded to before where because of the victim there was an outcry when 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 the when the when the person was released on bail and, and you had the mayor of toronto saying well in cases like this you should you should know uh you know you shouldn't have secrecy around the bail provision and that kind of misses the point right like no we don't have openness depending on who the victim is right we we, we have openness as a general principle to to protect everybody all the time um so it's it's interesting though to see that when when people perceive an interest that they're closer to being affected, they all of a sudden jump on the on the openness bandwagon um, and really start to think critically about whether this this makes sense. And of course, the, the criticism that was being made is, well, we don't know why this person's being released on bail, and and that's true, <laughs> and that's true in these cases, but uh, uh, it's true in all these cases, and uh, and so. Yeah, I do think, uh, you know, as, as has been alluded to, there, there's a lot of other important considerations that go into the criminal code. And I think sometimes some of these provisions don't, you know, just don't get updated um, or get, don't get the attention that, uh, that some other provisions do. And that's obviously unfortunate. Okay, so let me let me turn from the criminal kind of to the to the civil sphere and and Alexi, I know you've had experience um, representing people in in that arena, including plaintiffs who um, uh, have have been the victims of of alleged uh, misconduct. And and it's often thought that that those are the people, and 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 sometimes they are that are seeking publication bans to protect 
their um, privacy interests, often understandably. But that's not always it's not always the situation. It's not always the way that these the bans and even those types of cases come come about. So can you talk to us a little bit about your experience in in the dynamics that lead to publication bans being um, imposed in in that context, the civil context now? So in the civil context, um, as, as you said, Justin, I think there is often a perception that it's um, plaintiffs in a in a civil matter, especially if it's of a sexual nature, that are the ones that are going to seek either an anonymization order or some form of other some other form of publication ban. Um, and th sometimes that is the case, but it's. Um, I think there's a, a bit of a misperception on that. And I think it, the misperception comes from the fact that, as we've talked about in the criminal matters, there is an automatic um, decision to anonymize the complainants. And so I think that that sort of carries over into the civil context, in, at least in the public perception of, um, well, therefore, it's the complainant or the plaintiff in a civil matter that then is going to be seeking that type of an order. And that's not always the case. Um, and I, I, I want to go back to something that Alicia was mentioning before, because I think it's a really important point to highlight that we can talk about the open court principle and openness. And um, it, I think those phrases sometimes become almost um, sayings of, of rote, that they're sort of assumed that everybody understands what we're talking about. And really what's at the core of so much of this, and Alicia mentioned it earlier, is public discourse. And she was talking about it in terms of um, when bail, condition, bail hearings aren't published, it can um, have an impact on the public discussion that happens. And I think that that translates into so many different areas where we're talking about publication bans and any form of restriction on the open court principle is, people aren't going to go and sit in court. Um, you know, we, we don't have time to do that. And as much as somebody might be interested in what happens in court and in public issues that are being heard in court, we don't have time to go and sit in court. But we do read the newspapers or online or Twitter or however that we, we take in media. And unless these are being reported, that discussion can't happen because we don't know about the issues that are being brought up. And unless we, as the public, know about these issues, we can't talk about it. We can't have a discussion about some things that are so fundamental, like bail, but also in the context of the civil issues, issues that are happening that might have bigger implications than just one person being sexually assaulted or being the victim of harassment or any other type of issue. Um, and so, it, for example, there could be a case where um, there's an institution that is involved that is being involved and they're a defendant in civil litigation. Um, and maybe there's a you know, there'd be a public interest in having a discussion about the institution. And if this institution is one that is known or has a history of abuse or other types of issues happening at that institution, unless the media or the public is getting access and we're having information that's being given to us about this institution, then how can we have a discussion about whether or not, you know, about that institution, whether it's a public institution or a private institution, an institution where other people, other members of the public may attend. We can't have that discussion. We can't know what's going on unless that's being reported. And so that's really what's at the core of this and why the open court principle is so important because without that information, we, we won't know about it. Um, so there, there is a case at the moment and Alicia's paper is one of the media outlets, the, the media outlet that's involved in it and it deals with the school. And in that case, it is the, um, the, the defendant, it's a civil case, but the defendants want the name of the school anonymized um, and a publication ban um, attached to that because they don't, they are worried if the name of the school is reported and information is published, um, that then they could be identified as well. And this, this is currently going through the courts and there is a, a appeal that's going to be heard on this case um, in a few months because the, they were successful in getting the, the school anonymized. 
there is a public decision that is out about this school. Um, and one of the things that's mentioned in the decision is that the school has a history of this. There's at least one other case of this type of abuse happening at the school and the school has publicly apologized for this. Um, and so here is another case that has been brought up about this same school. And you know, should there be a discussion about the role of the school and how can the public have that discussion unless the school is, is identified? Um, and as I said, the, it's the defendants in that case who have argued for the anonymization of the school, not of them. No one in the case is arguing that the minor defendants ought to be named. They've all agreed that the, the, their identity should be protected, but the school has asked, the minors asked for the school to be withheld. Um, so again, this comes back to this very fundamental and important aspect of having a discourse um, that we can't have unless it's being reported. Thank, thank you for that. There's a lot, lot of shout outs to the star in today's conversation. It's, uh, <laughs> um, and, and well, with that, let me, let me turn to you, Alicia. Let me, let me ask uh, you, you to pick up on something you said before when you were describing um, a publication ban made in, in the case that was, had some similarities to the Retea Parsons situation where um, the uh, parents were kind of prevented to talk about talking about certain conduct that that had had happened to their uh, their child. Um, that's not the only situation you've kind of reported on recently where there's been a publication ban made with what some would say uh, absurd consequences. There was another story I think you, you said that in the article, Justin, I think. Well, some, yes, yeah, some distinguished commentators might use that phrase. Uh, but you reported on another case uh, a few months ago now, a woman in Kitchener-Waterloo, um, victim of sexual assault, who was then fined for violating a publication ban. This also goes back to what you were talking about earlier, but these are, these are bans that apply not just to journalists. They apply to members of the public. They apply to participants in a case um, uh, and 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 her situation she was she was charged for sharing an unredacted version of uh, of a transcript or for, that included the court ruling with with a group of family and and friends um, can you can you talk the audience through you know what happened in 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 that case and maybe more generally kind of how that's informed your view of whether um, publication bans uh, always serve a, a purpose, a logical purpose, given their intention. Yeah, so this case was really something. So um, a woman was sexually assaulted by her husband. He was convicted. It was quite a serious, it was described as quite serious. Um, and as Alexi talked about in the criminal justice context, almost always there is a publication ban that is placed on the victim or complainant in a sexual assault. It's actually not um, an automatic ban like the child pornography ban I talked about. It's mandatory on request, but it's treated as if it's automatic. So, and this is something that I've written about before, but complainants are not actually often consulted about whether they want to ban often and increasingly they don't, right? People want to be able to talk about it. The stigma is different for different people. They're still, anyway, I could talk about that for a while, but people often may not want the ban, but they're also, even if they do want it, no one is like sitting down with them and going, here's what a publication ban is, here's what it covers, here's what it means, here's how you follow it. And so publication ban means that not only can I not write a story about you naming you in the Toronto Star, it means that you cannot name yourself in like a public forum. And there's lots, of, I know maybe Alexi will weigh in on this, but there's lots of interesting questions about what a public forum is. Is that like your Facebook page? Is that like, your personal Facebook page, your public Facebook page, is that Twitter, like, where can this happen? How can you do this? But in this case, what the woman did was she got a transcript of the decision in her case because there wasn't like a written one that a judge put out where everything was nicely anonymized or redacted. She just got the transcript and then she sent an email to like a small group of people that her like friends and supporters, her family, like a small group of people who already knew who she was, knew who her husband was, knew what had happened. It was like, here's the decision. Someone forwarded that decision. We don't know who. Someone forwarded that decision to her husband or ex-husband, I guess. Um, 
And she at some point ended up telling the police that she had done this little email to like this group of people. And she was charged with violating a court order and entered a plea and was and it, it admitted it. And there was a, a, an agreed statement of facts in which the, the Crown kept referring to the husband as the complainant, even though she was the one protected by the publication ban. If there was no publication ban in the case, like anyone could name him. Like the ban doesn't protect him and it protects her. Um, she was fined $2,000 plus six, a $600 victim surcharge, even though like really the only person victimized by the sharing of this publication ban to people who already knew her name was herself, the only person who could be harmed. Although I guess like the perspectives that the court was harmed by her violating this order. Anyway, this is outrageous. This came to light because a Waterloo Region record reporter happened to be in court that day for something else, wrote a story about it, and then other lawyers got involved. They appealed the decision and the Crown um, agreed to like withdraw or stay the charge or something like that, but not because they did something wrong by prosecuting a case that was, I would say arguably, but it's pretty clearly not in the public interest to prosecute and no one was really harmed by this. Um, they withdrew it because of a technicality. And it just like raises <laughs> just a level of like absurdness to like, was this even a violation? Like one, was this even a violation of the publication ban? To, like you could make an argument about that and they probably would have if it had actually gone to argument. And two, like what is the public interest in this and who was actually harmed by the violation of the publication ban, right? Um, it And it also like three maybe, and this is like maybe most important is that no one is like helping um, complainants understand what the publication ban covers and it puts them in a, like really dangerous situations. And I don't think this was actually a dangerous situation in the sense of like, I don't think that necessarily harm was done, but like in other cases, it's like, you know, can you talk about your sex assault on Facebook? Can you like, how, like, how do you communicate about it? And it wouldn't it be incredibly harmful for you not be able to do that? Um, and it, anyway, um, just com a completely bizarre case and like one where like it really raises just a lot of questions. Yeah, I think when one of the consequences and, and a, a term that lawyers kind of use for one of the one of the consequences you described is this idea of a chilling effect, right? I mean, if you have this order out there that um, on the one hand isn't particularly easy to find and sometimes not particularly easy to understand um, as as you've set out exactly what it covers, maybe not in this case, but in other cases. Um, and you have um, the possibility of serious consequences for violating that order. I mean, those two things taken together can result in not just journalists, but people at large um, kind of refraining from um, being able to express themselves or share opinions uh, on a particular case for fear of running afoul of that um, order, which is one of the um, one of the problems with 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 the regime, uh, at least in certain cases. Um, Paul, I want to I want to turn to you um, and discuss from from a maybe not uh, your your personal perspective, but a judge's perspective in general, some of the challenges, uh, or your personal perspective if you prefer, but some of the challenges that that can arise when you're dealing with publication ban um, requests, uh, and particularly when you're trying to apply the the discretionary test, the test that asks you to kind of consider, you know, is there a serious risk to an important public interest here and are there alternatives to that risk and I mean one of the things I've found in these cases that it, it can become um, very much a kind of hypothetical exercise or trying to stare into the future type exercise um, uh, to try and determine you know is it is this risk going to happen what are the chances this risk is going to happen um, it can often call for uh, not necessarily speculation, but a degree of kind of informed um, uh, hypothesizing about how things are going to play out in, in, in the future when you're trying to weigh the risk side of the equation. The, the harm to the 
free expression interest in the open core principle, that's easier to, to at least kind of get your hands around. But um, as, as a lawyer, I found that one of the kind of challenging aspects of these cases to, to argue. I wonder if um, that's a perspective that you think is shared by decision makers. Well, I, you know, I think uh, decision makers struggle with this. Um, you know, you're, we sit in an adversarial process. One side decides for whatever reason that they want, you know, that they think there's a risk out there and their job as advocates is to protect their client and, you know, and argue that um, some kind of ban should be imposed to protect some um, potential harm down the road. And I think, I think judges are increasingly alive to the fact that there is a pretty high test for that, that, uh, you know, Alexi talked about early on in this discussion, um, you know, there's a famous line that uh, publication bans are not available for remote and speculative concerns. And that's a line that was written by the Supreme Court of Canada about 30 years ago in one of the leading cases on this that set out the test. So you do have to, you know, you have to ask yourself those questions. And those are issues which to some extent involve a little bit of crystal ball gazing. But if you're into crystal ball gazing, um, you're kind of into speculation. Um, I think one of, the, one of the bigger practical challenges um, that I've experienced as well since I've been a judge over the last couple of years, um, and that I think people uh, can address in a kind of a practical way is, is where, what precisely is the information that is of concern? And that's often a challenge. Um, it comes up in, in criminal cases, it comes up <clears throat> a lot in civil and commercial cases where parties will say, well, we've got all this commercial information or financial information or in other civil cases, personal information, um, you know, that might involve, you know, financial records or other kinds of sensitive stuff about health records, for example, that I think some people would have a fair amount of sort of sympathy for those kinds of privacy interests, but you can't take them too far. Um, and those are, the practical challenges that I think judges face where someone says, I want to ban, or the media says, oh, you can't ban anything. And, and there's, there's got to be some give and take in, in what, what really does merit some restriction on access to protect some um, serious harm that could result from the disclosure of some delicate financial information or health information. Um, you know, in saying that, I'm not saying that, that can, that's an easy test to get over itself, but one of the challenges, you know, that I face too is, well, you know, what precisely are we talking about here um, that should or shouldn't be banned and why? And I think that's one way of overcoming the, the speculative nature of it, the crystal ball gazing nature of it, which is to say, you know, what's, what's really the tangible concern that has to be faced? And, and I think, you know, media can, uh, can help on that too in saying, look, at, uh, we, we understand there can be some specific information. You know, they don't want the bank account numbers. Uh, they might not even need, you know, the, some of the health information. Uh, they want to get at the, the information that, that really underlies, you know, one of the basic underlying principles of the open court principle, which is how do we scrutinize what a judge is doing? Because that's, you know, that's one of the, one of the, the I think to me, the two real core principles that underlie this is um, uh, judges are unelected, they're appointed for a long time, and the only way that they are held to account is by publicity and by public scrutiny. Um, and um, does that mean that everybody's got to get everything? Ideally, I, you know, I get why the media argues for that, and I did it for many years. And, and, uh, and you know, and, and I am full of respect today for the media lawyers who argue those things. But um, 
there there can be some give and take. I, I am reminded of a, a case I did many years ago for the media. It involved a, a, cab, a finance minister in Ontario who was a, also a member of a family that had a very large business that was the subject of an RCMP investigation. And uh, there was a search warrant, you know, about two feet tall about this. And uh, there was a ban on everything instantly without any notice, uh, as one can get. This is a search warrant context. And the media lawyers all charged into court a few days later to say, um, we need this opened up. And the uh, prosecutor uh, said to the judge, can I just have a day or two? And we're sort of going, what's going on? And uh, we talked to the prosecutor and he said, look, I know this is way too broad. Give me a couple of days. I'll come back with something that's much more limited and narrow to protect certain kinds of information. And, uh, and he did. We went back a few days later and we got about 90% of it. Sure, some things were blacked out, but it was largely information that didn't have that much of an impact as far as understanding what was going on, what was going on with this very public figure and what the courts were doing with it. And I remember saying to the prosecutor, what changed your mind? And he paused, he said, I read the law. He's now a judge. <laughs> the prosecutor, sorry. Uh, as, yeah. is, yes, yes, he is. <laughs> as is Justice <laughs> Sheamus. <laughs> and it's not me, I was the idiot. <laughs> But thank you, Ryder. You're right. <laughs> we both know who he was. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Let me um, go to uh, Ange for the time we have uh, left, and maybe get some questions from the um, from the audience. Uh, yeah, first, I just want to remind the audience that uh, if they have questions about publication bans and open courts, they can use the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the first question is uh, from an attendee, and they ask, it seems bail hearings are automatically subject to a 517 publication ban. Are these in fact automatic? And what if the accused doesn't want one? Are there ever scenarios where a Crown would want to impose one perhaps to make an accused appear le like less of a sympathetic character? Well, I, I think we we touched on this earlier in the in the context of talking about the the Toronto 18. So, but the, the the short answer is that a publication ban is mandatory when sought by the accused, and discretionary if sought by the crown in a bail hearing context. If if you had a, a bail hearing context where the crown was seeking a discretionary publication ban, but the accused was saying that they did not want want one, leaving aside the Toronto 18 situation where you had a, a combination of interests, but in a case like that, I like to think that the judge would not impose a publication ban unless there was something other than the fair trial interests uh, at stake. So it's a, it, to just to follow up on that, uh, what that means when it's discretionary for the crown, because the, the person who was asking the question was saying, you know, can the crown, what, you know, how automatic is it? The, if the crown wants it and the accused doesn't, the crown has to meet the high test that Alexi described, the, known as the Dagenet Mentak test. They have to establish that it is necessary to protect fair trial or other very important interests, that there's no alternative means uh, or all, lesser alternatives available to protect that interest. And even then, um, the interest in uh, protecting those rights uh, must outweigh the very important interest in openness. I guess there could be a situation where, uh, I'm actually not aware of a case where this has happened, but you could imagine a situation where the judge doesn't think the Crown has made a case for the blanket bail hearing publication ban under the code, but perhaps uses a residual kind of common law discretion to impose discretion over certain people's identities or, or a more tailored publication ban, but doesn't kind of seal the whole thing up um, if the accused doesn't want it. But just like a more common situation that I run into is that people forget to ask for these publication bans. Like they're not, you know, unless the media is like there and like if by the media, I mean like more than just like me sitting in the corner of the courtroom, not like alarming anybody. People forget to ask for these things. And it's like only later, um, or if I like ask somebody, if I ask the crown or I ask the defense 
explore that they go, oh crap, like we should have put that publication ban on. So it's not something like you do have to ask for it. Um, and often people don't. And anyway, it's just like a, a weird quirk of like, sometimes these get applied after I ask a question. Okay, Ange, do, do we have another question? Uh, yeah, the next question is from Gerald, and Gerald asks, are there other jurisdictions that make information about the existence and nature of publications uh, readily available electronically? And if so, why doesn't Ontario do so? If, if such jurisdictions exist, I've yet to have a case that touches um, on one. In fact, I think on in, in Ontario, in terms of, it's a bit of a different um, a little bit of a departure from the question, but in terms of the notice system that um, Paul was speaking about earlier, the notice to the media system, I think that's probably uh, on the on the kind of forefront of things. I'm not sure uh, a lot of other provinces have that developed of a system, um, but I I haven't ran into any province with a kind of centralized. Uh, easy to access database of, of pub bans or, or sealing orders, although it maybe it does exist somewhere. I don't know if any of the other panelists have have run into that. Pretty sure it doesn't exist in does not exist in Canada. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'm curious because Canada is also uh, pretty far behind in terms of digitizing uh, court proceedings generally, although the pandemics given us a, a large boost forward, but um, but I'd be curious in the United States, which which generally has more access to court mm -hmm. records through, through online, if, if it's easier to find out uh, what limitations there are. Of course, there's fewer limitations on openness in, in the US as well. Um, but I suspect without knowing that, that in, a, in a jurisdiction like that, where access to court records is generally easier, they would also be easier to find out when, when access is being denied and why. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would think in, in Ontario is behind the times when it comes to um, just being able to access court files in general. Um, I'm sure Alicia pulls her hair out on a regular basis trying to get access to court records in Ontario. Um, other jurisdictions in Canada are better about electronic access to court files, um, but not specifically with relation to publication bans. Okay. It raises some Sorry, interesting on. issues about, uh, about what's happening now with the courts. Um, and, you know, one of the arguably a, a, a benefit of what's happened with the pandemic has been its thrust uh, the courts, and I think the Chief Justice has said that, you know, my Chief Justice said we, we in, in the last 18 months, the Superior Court in Ontario has gone from the 19th century to the 21st century. We jumped right over the 20th century because we're now holding all of these trials on the internet, which raises interesting issues about publication bans and the ability to view trials and record trials and potentially replay them or edit them uh, and so on. Uh, and, but also we've moved to uh, very quickly towards electronic uh, filing of records and so on, because everybody's got to do everything in a paperless format. Now that hasn't yet, I don't think, translated into ease of access to the public to everything, but it's only a matter of time before that happens. And then there will be some issues around uh, that the courts are gonna to have to devise around, um, you know, what, uh, what do you do with documents that are to be sealed? You don't just put them in a sealed envelope if they're electronic documents and on databases. And what do you do about notification of publication bans? And I think courts are getting better about putting notices, for example, on certain kinds of decisions and so on as to what is subject to a ban or not. But, you know, those are those are challenges we're going to have. I mean, another thing that we've been talking a bit around about is the, the publication bans that we talk about when we talk about bail hearings and uh, preliminary inquiries are bans on publications in a newspaper or a broadcast. Um, 
uh, it doesn't, you know, and, and that's a question. I, I, I don't want to say too much because I'm a judge. I, I shouldn't venture into expressing my own sort of speculative views about what the law should or shouldn't be. But I think there are interesting issues today in the context of the internet and Zoom and YouTube and everything else that's happening around what is um, a newspaper or a broadcast. Um, just to like highlight kind of the absurdity of that. Um, so for the first time during the pandemic, we had like judgments being broadcast on YouTube. Um, and that was a really exciting thing. But we were not allowed to embed the YouTube link into like my story about like, here's the judgment coming out today. You had to only like direct people to that link because they're like the court's view was like the, I mean, it's broadcasting, like it just is so like, but they drew this like weird line between like it being broadcast on YouTube and being like having that YouTube link shared anywhere else in any kind. So like you couldn't run that YouTube link on CP24, even though it doesn't make logical sense. So it's really, it is fascinating. It's a fascinating issue. Yeah, the, the YouTube publication has kind of erased, erased the line or at least, um, you know, uh, blurred it more between kind of the classic paradigm which i think alexi was referring to before where it's like i mean the publication you really rely on the media to be in court and we of course we still do but because people can't you physically can't stop your work in the middle of the day and go sit in a courtroom and watch something but it's easier for a lot of people to physically take an hour out of their work day and watch a youtube like and some of those youtube verdicts we're talking about there were tens of thousands of people watching um, in that case, I mean, the distinction between that and allowing somebody to replay that video, I mean, it's, it's more difficult to see a principled one. Um, I know we have a bunch of questions we're going to try and get to in the time that remains. So let me go back to Ange for, for the next one. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Lisa. And Lisa asks, uh, regarding the KW case, I would suggest that the underlying problem is the degree to which sexual assault complainants are denied agency. Many parties act in a way they think are a benefit to the sexual assault complainant without actually asking a complainant what they want. Do you have any thoughts on this? I'm happy to jump in. Um, <laughs> I, I do have thoughts um, on this, yes. Um, as someone who acts for um, people who have, um, who, um, are, are dealing with the best avenue to address sexual assault or um, non-consensual sharing of intimate images, um, harassment, stalking. Um, I deal with all of those issues. Um, and it uh, th there obviously is a, a place for the criminal system without a doubt, um, but it is something where um, I regularly have conversations with my clients about the fact that the the criminal system, the objective is not for them. That that's not the objective of the criminal system. And so you're very you're absolutely correct. Um, there is a an issue with complainants in the criminal system. Um, you know, the the crown is not their lawyer. The crown is not there to advance their interest. Um, and that can happen in a civil context, but not in the criminal context. Um, and so it is, you know, trying to navigate that, um, those waters to see, you know, where objectives are going to be met with, um, with someone who's um, had these things happen to them is a, it's an interesting discussion and a very delicate discussion to have about what, which pathways they want to seek. Um, and unfortunately, there does still um, there is still a perception that if you don't go to the police, if you don't choose the criminal path, that that's an indication that maybe you, something didn't happen to you. Um, and there that we still see that myth um, perpetuated, um, unfortunately. And so there, there that's a, a, a very it, it's a very astute observation, a difficult observation, because it you know we've got. In, in the Crown's context, they're bringing forward a case on behalf of the Crown, not on behalf of the complainant. The complainant's not necessarily going to be consulted about a variety of things. Um, and the part of the, the 
discussion that I often have is exactly what you, the word you used, agency, taking control, and that it can be very difficult for someone who is in this position that's had these things happen to them to then feel like they have been, that agency has been stripped from them yet again through the criminal system. Um, not, not saying in any way that the civil system will give them back that agency. Um, unfortunately, the civil system doesn't necessarily provide that either. It can, but um, unfortunately, oftentimes at the end of civil litigation, um, a plaintiff doesn't doesn't feel like they're, you know, vindicated. You know, the idea of seeking justice and getting justice, unfortunately, our court system isn't um, the best system to achieve that objective either. And that's, that is a discussion I have regularly with people who come to seek my advice. Okay, Ange, um, can we go to the next question, please? Uh, yeah, the next question is from Anna. And Anna asks, is there any handbook that addresses the kind of questions Alicia pointed out that journalists or members of the public may have if they are impacted by a publication ban? Ah, I wish I like had somewhere to direct you. There's a couple of like, there is like um like an old thing that um uh, the judges education form has like out that's like on the internet. That's a pretty good primer. Regarding sexual assault publication bans, um Ryerson uh their sex assault center does have um like a guide for complainants about how it all works and how you can get a ban lifted and like what it means and they do have something like that, but there isn't like a super great easy to follow primer, which is like part of the problem for sure. You can get one of these textbooks I had to buy in journalism school for a course, like the one writer teaches too. <laughs> the online resource you're talking about, I know what you're talking about. That's, that's not a bad place to start though, um, as far as what's available. Um, okay, Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Talia. Uh, Talia asks, are there other jurisdictions whose default tilts more toward openness than Canada and Ontario? And if so, what of their provisions would you support being introduced here? Well, um, the United States, yeah. uh, I mentioned before, um, has a general rule of what they call no prior restraint, uh, which is basically, um, they're generally against publication bans. I'm not even sure. I mean, obviously there would be situations where they impose uh, publication bans, but uh, not uh, certainly nowhere near um, the extent to which it happens in Canada. And um, I would adopt all of it, given the fact that <laughs> it seems like, uh, you know, th there's no big outcry about uh, trials being derailed through, through the media uh, in, U.S. jurisdictions, um, because it's not happening. Um, so, you know, I, I tend to think that, uh, and obviously, if you had, we don't have any, uh, at least, pure uh, criminal defense lawyers on this panel. I think criminal a criminal defense lawyer would, have, would present a very different perspective. But I would certainly be in favor of adopting a, a system that's that's much more like the U.S. Uh, when it comes to uh, at least the fair trial considerations. No, no system is perfect. Um, the Americans, we often read about grand juries in the United States, but we don't know what goes on in a grand jury room because those are completely secret. Um, and while, you know, the Americans have their own unique history based on the First Amendment, um, such that some of the, the sort of typical publication bans that we talk about don't exist, um, they have their own other challenges with secrecy. Uh, I think with respect to other common law countries, because our law is sort of this English common law uh, system, um, we are uh, at least as open as the United Kingdom. Um, when I was a media lawyer, I, I did a lot of work internationally, and I, 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 can, I would have expressed the view um, that I think we the Canadian law uh, tilts more towards openness than other common law countries such as Australia and New Zealand uh, and uh, um, some of the other uh, ones that have their roots in, in, in English common law. And also we're more open than the civil law jurisdictions, the European jurisdictions, which have a lot different traditions than we do around um, access to justice. So, 
uh, it's not all bad. Uh, it's not all good. No system is perfect. But I think, uh, you know, it, the question was, uh, well, what about other countries? Um, I think Canada is much more open than, than most of the others. We're also just going to start seeing more conversations about cameras in the courtroom. I mm -hmm. won't go into it, but like other jurisdictions have cameras in the courtroom, particularly the, the US, and we're getting increasingly close to that here, but that's still really contentious. So, you know, we've seen how it works in other countries. You know, some justices think it's a matter of time, some don't. We'll see. All right, Ange, do we have any any further questions? Uh, yeah, we have another question from Colin. Uh, Colin asks, what are the panel's thoughts on retroactive application or removal of bans or redactions to content previously circulated through legal publishers? Should courts and publishers ensure the public is aware of status changes? And Colin says the BC Superior Courts do this very well. So that's an interesting question because, of course, you know, circumstances do change later. Uh, uh, journalists, historians want to go back and look at something that is subject to a ban that was protecting an interest that has become attenuated. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are cumbersome, but there are legal procedures that can be taken to, to try to address those things. Um, I think it's a good, it's a good question. It's something that, uh, it used to come up from time to time in, in my work, and I'm sure it come up, it came up, comes up in writers and other people's work. Um, I'm not aware of a particular sort of system that, uh, that puts uh, necessarily timelines on things. Some judges have put timelines on the, uh, on, on how long a ban should, should last. Bans on things like, uh, bail hearings and preliminary inquiries only last until the case is completed. So, you know, technically, uh, Alicia can report on a bail hearing. It's just no one's going to want to read about it because it will have happened two or three years ago. Uh, and news is news when it's news, not, uh, not when it's three years later. That's the problem with a lot of these things. Uh, there, there was a recent Supreme Court case just dealing with kind of this idea of varying a ban depending on when the circumstances change. Um, the case is called CBC in Manitoba, where where the court kind of cleared up that procedurally, at least in certain circumstances, you can go back to the same level of court and ask them to reconsider the ban. This was previously an area of confusion and potentially a problem because if you had to keep kind of appealing a ban every time you wanted to change it rather than going back to the same court and asking them to reconsider it that presents a lot of hurdles um practically speaking so i think the courts are kind of at least kind of catching up to this idea that you know circumstances can change and we have to at least provide a procedural route for people to come back without appealing an order and just convincing the court that the circumstances uh, warrant a second look at a ban that was made. Um, we might have time for, for one more question, Ange. Uh, okay, the next question is from Terrence. And Terrence asks, is it the same practice elsewhere in the world for bail, for bail hearings to be treated as they are in Ontario? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody else knows the law of bail in other jurisdictions. Just like we've said throughout like the US, like tons more information comes out immediately after someone is arrested than it is allowed to do here. Um, very extensive charging documents are filed in court. Those are the kinds of documents that go like, here's exactly what the person is accused of. Here's like all the things that we're alleging they did. That is what's covered by the publication bans here. And so those are routinely part of news stories in the US. So obviously they're, they're not doing it but I don't know that's like a like it's probably like a state level thing but yeah yeah, yeah on the other hand um in in the United States I know a, a lot of American lawyers were surprised to hear from me a number of years ago that uh, we have access to presumptively at least we have access to search warrant information and in many states of the United States they do not and that's a that's a huge source of information for the media in looking at investigations. 
So it cuts both ways, but I, I can't comment on bail provisions. I mean, in the United States, a lot of criminal law varies from, uh, from state to state. So there could be, you know, there will be a 51 different rules about bail hearings in the United States. Yeah, just to kind of co compare that to what we've been talking about. I mean, I think we've we've kind of said this implicitly, but just to make it clear for listeners, I mean, what we've been talking about in terms of both the criminal law stuff and the civil law test um, that we've been talking about that Alexi talked about near the beginning, those are those apply across Canada. Criminal law is is federal in Canada applies in every jurisdiction, and the Supreme Court's test similarly applies um, across the country. So th those pieces don't vary from uh, from province or territory. Uh, one to another. Okay, I think that takes us to um, the the end of our time, um, and uh, I want to thank uh, all of the uh, the panelists for for their time and energy participating in this. And again, to Jim and his team at Ryerson and the sponsors for giving us an, op an opportunity to to geek out about publication bans. Uh, uh, it was uh, a fascinating discussion and uh, one that I really enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank all of you for uh, a really stimulating uh, discussion. I, I wouldn't characterize it as geeking out. Uh, <laughs> it's not an area in which I'm particularly knowledgeable, and I found your discussion fascinating. And there are a lot of broad issues that you raised um, that are relevant for us as the public and and uh, issues that we have to wrestle with in terms of generally the public's right to know. Um, I, I, in addition to thank you, I want to thank the audience for uh, for joining us today. Um, a video of the uh, panel will be posted on the Center for Free Expressions website uh, likely tomorrow afternoon or at worst uh, on Friday morning. If you want to uh, see that, uh, you can or refer others uh, who haven't seen this, but uh, who you think would be worthwhile to do. Uh, our website is cfe.ryerson.ca. Uh, and you can also there see the, the videos of all our previous uh, panels and conversations. Our next one, which is going to be next week, is a very different topic. It's part of our series called Taming Big Tech. Uh, exploring the alternatives. And it's going to be featuring Taylor Owen uh, talking about governing big tech in Canada, uh, which is really quite relevant given one of the priorities of the new liberal government is to introduce a number of bills relating to ways to uh, uh, tame big tech. Uh, Taylor is the host of an excellent podcast titled Big Tech. He's the Beaverbrook Chair in Media, Ethics, and Communications at McGill University and the founding director of the Center for Media, Technology, and, and Democracy. And he's going to be in conversation with Andrew Clement, who's a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information, where he coordinates the information policy research program. So for more information about this event, which will be next Tuesday, uh, November 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, for information about that or any of our upcoming events or uh, in order to see uh, what videos there are of past events on our diversity of subjects, uh, go to our website, cfe.ryerson.ca. Thank you very much for attending today. Bye-bye.